we'll go through a couple more of these and we'll finish that and have some time for interaction and talk and then wrap it up with a list. Are you okay? Sure. Uh, yeah. Nice lamp. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've got about half an hour before the sugar freezes, <laughs> so I've got to really move. <laughs> Just barely make it from one cup of coffee to the next, really, in the afternoon. Okay, the third area that we're talking about here is uh, ministry application. You may want to look back over your notes in terms of the field concept. Ministry application had to do with professionals, positional ministry, uh, the latter one is the ladder decline, the vertical relationship, all that. Here, when we come to, to actually getting ministry done, and we're defining ministry as meeting needs in Jesus' name, that's our definition of ministry. And it's by and through every believer. In other words, are you a believer? <laughs> then you're qualified. Why do you say, why this person, you know, they, they, don't, they don't even pray good prayers. I know I've seen God answer some of the most pitiful prayers, haven't you? It's <laughs> 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 pitiful. <laughs> he went ahead. And, and I've seen, I know I've prayed, and he's, he's answered and done things that I didn't even ask him to do. You know, I mean, he listened, like he listened to my prayer and said, well, I'll go ahead and do what, what really ought to be praying about. You can go ahead and humor yourself a little bit. But, but it's, see, ministry is not based on, on uh, I'm going to be careful in saying this, I'll be understood at least, but it's not based on experience or position or longevity. Experience in ministry can be a very dangerous thing because experience tends to say to you that you really do know what you're doing. And that probably is never true. Uh, I, I really don't think. See, we have never faced today before. We face every situation fresh. But experience says, I've done this before. But you've not been with this person at this time before. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there has to be the, the, the development of, of an ability to rely on the ministry of Christ at every given point yes. in terms of our ministry. That, that indwelling presence of Christ. Holy Spirit, able to teach, because He is the eternal Spirit. He has faced this stuff before. And then we become then uh, the agents through whom he, he operates and works and moves. So that, that, that every believer, what we, what we endeavor to do is help them understand what it means to live with Jesus. Old Eli wasn't much of a priest. He, he, he really, in fact, the scripture says in Samuel that that the Word of God was rare at Shiloh. That means nobody could ever remember when God had spoken there. Uh, and, and Eli, it took him three times to figure out what was going on with Samuel. But he finally figured out, this must be God talking. <laughs> and, but he gave to Samuel the two things that Samuel never ever again moved without. In fact, that he used for the rest of his life. He gave him the ability to recognize the voice of God and gave him the ability to respond to the voice of God. He said, that's the Lord speaking, and when he, if he speaks again, this is what you say. To hear and respond to Christ. To hear and respond to, to God. Now, within the context of our pastoral influence, that's what I want with, with, with people. That's what I want with myself. To hear and respond to the voice of God. If we can do that, then, then we can, in fact, minister the life of Christ in whatever setting that we're asked to do that in with a great deal of confidence and ability. There has to be a breakdown of the lay and clergy dichotomy. Now that may seem at first to say that I don't care, I don't think there is a position for, for pastoral ministry. That obviously there is. What I want to break down here is that there is, is, is one Holy Spirit that the pastor works from and there's a whole other one that the laity works from. So that the, you do the, the little stuff. You, you handle the headaches, the ingrown toenails, and, 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 and the minor kinds of things. Uh, I'll take care of the big stuff. We, we have to break that down. Uh, the idea that somehow our prayers are more effective than anyone else. There are many people that don't believe they've been prayed for until the pastor's done praying. Mm -hmm. Well, see, Protestantism is based on a whole other premise, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We don't pray to saints. We don't go through intermediaries to God. The, the, the genius of, of our understanding of God is that we all, with open faces, can, in fact, address God directly. You don't need intermediaries to go anyplace. And, and that's why, as a pastor, I, I tried to lay hands on as few people as possible. I don't want 
people get addicted to my hands because my hands are out of town, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So he says, believers will lay hands on the sick and the recovery. Yeah. Well, are you a believer? Do you have a hand? Yeah. Okay, you're in business. That's it. You got what you need. So as in, as I'm not belittling the laying on of hands. I'm just saying that there is a tendency, particularly now, to look for the effective hands, to look for, you know, that, that intermediary that can, can really, I've been prayed for by, by the, the lightweights, but, you know, you're, you're really man of God, I need to pray for you. We need to, to work that down and, and not take this posture of, of, uh, of preference as a pastor. We, we took this even to the point, I don't want to get to the and certainly not under bondage or anything like that, but we, we took this uh, even to the point that we would not even provide special places to park for any of the pastoral staff. There was a good bunch of us and been nice and good park close. But we just we, we felt so strongly about about that kind of thing that we just we just said, no, we're not we're just not gonna do that. Uh, a pastor is a gift to a body of Christ. Uh, he's, a, he's, he's a present from Christ to that church, to that body. And because of that, he doesn't have to separate himself. I think that I see in Christ his ability to live closely with the people that he chose to be with. He lived with them. He, ate with them. he was with them. Well, someone said, you know, well, familiarity breeds contempt. It doesn't if you're not contemptuous. <laughs> <laughs> you're a nice person, they'll breed nonsense. Familiarity will breed whoever you are. If you're a mean person, they'll breed meanness. <laughs> And, and, uh, but I, I just don't see Jesus aside from his people. He was right in the middle mm -hmm. of the people. When you look for Jesus, he was in the middle of the crowd. And he led, he led from, from, from the, the crowd. And I think that's a very, excuse me, a very important thing to convey and, and to break that down. Thirdly, we have to break down the sacred sector of the economy. The reason that that's valid, valid is because we want to do as much as possible to dislocate ministry from the building. I want you to understand that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. You're where God dwells. So where you are, God is present. Okay? Now, in Scripture, sacredness is always defined by the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Wherever God was, that was sacred. Moses turned aside to see the bush. Well, bushes had burst into flame there for many years and still do. The thing that caught Moses' attention was what? <coughs> Was the bush wasn't consumed. Yep. It kept burning much longer than the obvious fuel that it had. So he turned aside to see that. And then God spoke to him, as you know, and said, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. Well, what made that ground cold? Well, it wasn't because Moses was there. He'd probably been there that many times. And it wasn't because the bush was, just, was burning. It was because God was present. See, God and his presence define sacredness. So if, in fact, he dwells in you, then where you are is sacred. For the Christian, all of life is sacred. There are no holy places. There are no holy days. There are no pilgrimages. When we go to, to, to Palestine and sit in some of the spots where Jesus actually Stood at that. There's such an awe there. But that's no more sacred than any place there is in Israel. It has memory to it. It has history to it. It has emotion to it. But in terms of raw sacredness, it doesn't gain a thing. Mm -hmm. And when I understand that wherever I am, God is present simply because I'm there, Then I can begin to risk being open and available to Christ. If I think He has sent me and He's back here grading me to see how I'm going to do, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk anything. But you see, He so He so comfortably lives in us. We used to be interested in, in people that were always saying, "The Lord told me this, the Lord told me that, the Lord told me that." And I, I remember thinking, as just a young pastor. I remember thinking, he never said anything to me. He, he talked to me because it seemed like all the heavyweights were having God talk to him. And I, I didn't want to be a heavyweight. I just would, I'd like to hear God. So I asked one of the guys, and I got to know him quite well. I said, uh, you, you say God speaks to you a lot. The Lord told me this. He said, yeah. I said, let me ask you a question. If I had been with you when he did that, would I have heard him? 
And he just laughed. He said, well, no, of course not. Well, I said, then what are you saying? And he made a statement I thought was really good. He said, to me, the voice of God sounds just like my imagination, except it's better than anything I could imagine. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Uh, you know, you, you've heard yourself say things that are better than you know. Mm -hmm. Walk away thinking, where that come? Well, see, your imaginator got saved along the rest of it. Your huncher got saved. All of you, all of you. So, so we were built to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's unnatural not to be. It's natural to be filled with the Spirit. And so when I say to you that where you are, God is present, that should help you draw a deep breath and relax and live into the people's lives that you're associated with there. Mm -hmm. all, all of life is a sacred thing. My friend who wanted me to, to, to pray him into a different job, see, one of the things that he, he began to understand was his presence in that job meant that God was present there. Now I know this idea has been taken to sea and has gone in heretical terms. And if you don't know that, then don't worry about it. But trust me, it has. It's been taken to silly extremes. I'm not talking, therefore, that any kind of behavior is okay for you because you're dwelt by, by the Holy Spirit. See, that's not Christianity. That's Gnosticism. That's foolishness. We don't believe that. But for me to understand, gosh, I had a lady call me up and want to know if I'd visit her name. I said, well, why? She said she just, you know, she's having a lot of trouble. And, and going through hard times. <laughs> I just want the Lord to, to, to touch her. Well, I said, why don't you go next door and touch her? Why do you think God would be more present with your neighbor if I were there rather than if you were there? She said, well, I never thought of that. I said, let's talk about that for a minute. See, there's not one Holy Spirit for me and another one for you. You know Jesus? Yeah, I do. Then you can introduce him to anybody, any place, at any time. Well, I don't know what to say. Don't worry about it. Go about your name. Tell her you're there because you're just having a hard time. Is there anything you can do? She wants a glass of water? Give her a glass of water. I mean, whatever. You might do some huge spiritual thing. Huh? Run in, quote scripture, speak in tongues, do all those huge things. So just, just be there. And she did. She ministered life to her name. That, that, that's good. It's great. We've already talked about that one. Basically, we're all about motivation. Why does this church get out of bed in the morning? Christ can bring people to holiness. <coughs> Amen. 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 To be a change agent in the culture, not a competitor with the culture. Amen. Conceive of our Christian faith and our Christian walk as the scripture does in terms of leaven. High visibility Christianity has never done well. Christianity does not do well from the front pages of the newspaper. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Doesn't do well. Why? Because we're basically a leavening concept. We basically get into the nooks and crannies of culture or world and we help people be transformed in Jesus' name. Someone said, how can Christianity <clears throat> transform culture? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's supposed to be. I don't see that we were called to transform the culture. I think the culture is going down, going down, down the tubes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see any culture going to survive. But I'll tell you, I know how Christianity can transform people. It's one transformed person touching another person that needs transformation in Jesus' name. And, and, and that can move. Now, I, I'm not here saying, pull down all the signs or do anything more. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying, that, that, that there is such a dynamic power in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives <coughs> that if you can just relax and be who you really are in Jesus' name, 
where you are, understanding that he is present, <coughs> change will begin to happen. It will simply begin to happen. And you don't have to tap a fish on your forehead or anything like that. <laughs> It's just, if you need a mark for people to know that you're a Christian, you're in deep trouble anyway. Mm -hmm. So you know, don't, don't worry about it. There's not a fish that can help you. Just, just go ahead. But, but, but walk in. Be open. Be there. Be present. And, and, and things begin to change. There, there is a, this, this agent working in culture that is, in fact, a change agent. Five, dangers, tons of them. And they're major dangers. I mean, these are not small time major dangers. Ministry, first of all, is in the hands of non-professionals. That means it's in the hands of a bunch of people who have the finished idea what they're doing. That's a little scary. Particularly if you're the one building the church. Uh -huh. <laughs> Come on. But if you'll allow Jesus to build His church, then that's not a, that's not a scary thing. Lack of direct control by the leaders, yeah. If you're a person that needs to have control of everything all the time, this won't work for you. Mm -hmm. This not only appears to be out of control, it is. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, what if somebody does a stupid thing and uses our church name? They will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Depend on it, they will. <laughs> but what do people think? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was the faintest idea. Well, doesn't it matter? No, not really. Went up to a restaurant years ago, ordered some French fries. The guy came up, sat down beside me, reached over, and took one of my French fries. Huh. And I said, "Well, if you eat them, you pay for them." We got to talking. He didn't know who I was, of course. I didn't tell him. <laughs> he said, "Boy, we got a hippie church in town finally." <laughs> I said, "You're kidding?" <laughs> 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 he said, "No, you're on Division Street. That hippies lining up to go in that place." I said, "Really? What do hippies do in church?" Well, he said, I don't have a finished idea. <laughs> well, I said, aren't you curious? Well, no, he said, I never thought about that. I said, what would a bunch of dope hippies go to church for? That doesn't make sense to me. Why, why would they even do a thing like that? So we talked a little while about that. He bought my french fries. And I left. But I said, you know, if you're kind of worked up about this hippie church, I probably would why would you? I just kind of wanted to receive the different life. Might be interesting to find out what hit you in church. Well, I said, I just might do that. <laughs> <laughs> About three weeks went by and I stepped out on the platform. I looked way in the back and here's this guy sitting back there. That means, you know, it was classic and just wonderful because he had no idea who I was. Recognizing he's the guy that he bought the French fries for. He just kind of you know, did an open mouth kind of stare. I just want to be He didn't fall out of the worship God, but, but he did. <laughs> the point is, how do you control your reputation? <clears throat> Unless you're an outright sinner and you're sleeping around town and you're, you, you know, you're stoned or drunk in the local bar. Now, I'm assuming that most of you don't live like that. I would say that the majority of you here are upstanding Christian men and women. And if I'm wrong, then, you know, <laughs> change your life. <laughs> but how, how do you control what the world thinks of you? I, I'm always intrigued with Jesus when he turned to the disciples. He says, who would people say that? What, what's the reputation? Oh, some say you're a prophet, some say you're this, some say you're that. Well, then he said, no, but, but who do you say? You guys live with me. You guys, you know me. What do you say about me? Peter, you know, you're the cross, son of God. See that? And that to me is such a, such a profound thing because I don't think Jesus was just asking for a fact. I think part of what he was helping the disciples to, to see at that point was that people will have varying ideas of who you are and what you're doing. But the people that live with you need to know what's going on. If the people that live with you know what's going on, that must be the say. Billy Graham had a great, a great definition of integrity. He said, integrity is being the same person in private as you appear to be in public. Isn't that great statement? Mm -hmm. To be the same person in private as you appear to be in public. That, 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 that's such a, a 
simple, wonderful statement. But yeah, the, the church, the church is, is, is out of our control. Jesus says, if you'll let me build my church, then the gates of hell will open up. And I've lived long enough and done enough things on my own that I know that what I build, the gates of hell will open And I know what he builds, the gates of hell will open up. If you follow, let, let him build his church. Don't worry about control. I think one of the greatest, the greatest inhibitors of church growth is controlling pastors. Pastors have to have their hands on everything. It usually is a grasp of, 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 of a, a lack of confidence. They just can't risk anything being done wrong. It'll make them look bad. Let's give us a break. Mm -hmm. you know, let, let the Lord heal your perfectionism. Get on the flight. <laughs> Hmm. Leadership and pastoral roles are in constant change and refinement. I mean, he thinks to stay the same, look the same, act the same, continue the same. This won't work. Churches change, people change. We have to be able to, to work that. And there's confusion because of seeing non-traditional structure patterns. Um, people do tend to bring with them, even if they're not believers, they tend to bring with them an idea of what the church ought to be. Okay? And they'll look for those things. And when they don't find them, they'll get nervous. Mm -hmm. They'll get upset. Some of them will come and ask. Like the lady that I talked about in the book. She asked, you know, do you have an evangelism committee? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? Well, she said, I have, you know, several names and friends and acquaintances that, that, that need to come to the Lord. And, and the church I was at had an evangelism committee. And we'd give names and address. And they, they'd call them that's great. You know, we, we've got the biggest evangelism committee probably that any church ever had. <laughs> and she said, well, how do I get a hold of them? I said, you're in. <laughs> you're on it. You're in. Go for it. Well, she said, what do you mean? I said, honey, listen. These people know you. You're concerned about them. You know their address. You know their phone number. I mean, you know all of these things. Why do you want me to put together a structure to send a total stranger yeah. out to talk to them about what is probably the most significant thing you'll ever hear about in your entire life. And why would you want to miss out on that? Why wouldn't you want to take that good news to yourself? Well, she said, I do, but I didn't know it was proper. <laughs> I said, trust me, it's proper. It's proper. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, that's right. Help, help people. I, I just, sometimes I listen to some of the things that I've said, it sounds to me like I'm saying, go change things. <laughs> Please don't hear me say that. People are so, so valuable and so important. You, you can't just pull things that they value away from them and do it some other way just because you decide that's a better way to do it. You, you've got to lovingly talk with them, help them understand what's going on. I, I uh, pastors, I've still got a great, great letter in my file. When I started sitting down and speaking, it was strictly from fatigue, but it also happened to be just about the time our church started to grow explosively. And so everybody tied our, our explosive growth, I guess, with me sitting on a stool and teaching. And, and so, you know, they, stools proliferated all over the West Coast. It was crazy. <laughs> and, and so I got a letter, just a great letter from a guy. He said, uh, I think he was serious. He said, well, I came to your church. I went home, and I took away the hymn books, I got rid of the pulpit, and I started sitting on a stool. And he said, and there's still nothing going on. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a great letter? <laughs> well, you know, I started sitting down because I was tired. You know, we were having five services on Sunday, that's, that's pretty good. We were flying in the afternoon to another town where we were planning another church, so I was taking a private plane over there. And, and uh, I finished our third service in the morning, and the car would be running behind the church. I'd run out and jump in that thing, head for the airport. The plane would be warmed up, and we'd take off. And, and oh, I'm sorry. And I've got something to lean on. Can I lean on this? <laughs> and uh, uh, when I landed, they'd have a car you know, ready for me with a box of Colonel Chicken, Sanders Chicken, and a uh, bottle of Seven Up because it was always rough weather. <laughs> and, and come back the same way. By the time I got back at night, our first service would have already started, so I just get out of the car and go in. We had two more that night. 
Well, I was stupid at the end, but it was, it was, and it was what my life was, I think. And I, I couldn't even straighten my legs out on Monday afternoon. I, I couldn't get out there. My legs are tied up so tight that my back, I was just having tremendous trouble. And one of the guys came up to me and said, Jerry, why don't you just sit down? Well, I said, you can't sit down and preach. I'll never forget classic, classic dance. That's why I remember this story, because of what this guy said to me. He said, Pastor, really, the way you preach, you could lay down. <laughs> and then he didn't know your problem, right? And the next Sunday, they, they got me a large stool, so I said, I felt really good. <laughs> Nothing spiritual about that. That's very <laughs> spiritual stuff. You know, you know, do cute little things. You don't just change because somebody has a good idea. People are valuable people. You can't just twist them and bend them. And move them. They have to understand what you're doing. Uh, talk a lot. <laughs> talk a lot. And if you see lights come on, encourage that light. Give them some, give them some, you know, let, let light be contagious. Don't, don't rip people. People have had these things for years. And they remember to wrap them up those things to respect that. But at the same time, there can be pressure and movement with understanding in, in, in the direction that you sense the Lord is wanting to go in and, and take it. But it has to be comfortable to you. You can't do what I'm doing. I have a completely different personality than you've got. I don't know how these things will come through your personality. They need to come through in the way that you are comfortable with, in the way that you'll lead, in the way your people respond to. And, and so please hear me saying that. I'm not, I'm not wanting you to run home and rip something up. And, and, uh, in fact, I'm not wanting you to go home and do anything. I just want you to see, see some things. The results of it, pretty exciting to me, preservation of the true pastoral function, called facilitating leadership. As pastors, we are second-line people. We are not first-line people. We are not in the game. We are coaching the game. Amen. <coughs> very, very important for us to know. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are given for the purpose of what? So perfecting or equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. When the saints do the work of the ministry, the church is built up and the message goes out. When you do the work of the ministry, the church, if they like what you're doing, will support you. If they don't, they'll go someplace else. If it's your ball game, then all you can do is hope for cheers, a little money in the, in the basket, and hope you can get a better show next week than you had this week. You're in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. The question is not, do I have a great ministry? The question is, am I releasing great ministries? That's the question. Amen. What I want to do as your pastor is help you fulfill what's in your heart to do for God. Well, everybody has something that they want to do. Everybody has a vision. The scripture says, without a vision, the people perish. It doesn't say the leader perish. It says, without a vision, the people perish. If there's no vision there, and, and their vision is not our great thing that we're doing for God, come join me in my great ministry. And that, that's not what Christianity is all about. And that doesn't make sense. What I'm going to say as your pastor is, how can I help you accomplish what's in your heart? How, how can I help you be and do what, what really is in your heart to be and do? Can, can, can we... Can we get you going? <laughs> Help you with it. Get in the game. Preservation of each believer's ministry and calling. That's what I was just talking about. Don't ever steal the ministry of the saints. When you do something that they could do and could have done, I think you're stealing the ministry of them. had an interesting phone call. The, my secretary came in. She'd been with me for many, many years. It's a marvelous lady. She was kind of calm. She said, Jerry, I got a call here. It's so-and-so. Uh, and, -so. and uh, she's really been praying for her boss. She's an executive secretary when one of her firms in town. Been praying for him. He'd gone through a divorce. His life was just in shambles. And she's just praying to God somehow, you know, let me touch this man's life. And so finally, he, he'd, come, he'd called her in and asked her, about, you know, her faith and her head. She called my secretary and, and said, you know, the boss is just really ready to commit his life to Christ. And could, could we come in and talk to Jerry? Well, my, my secretary, you know, put on hold came in and told me that. He said, Karen, you know, I'm not going to give an appointment. There's no way they get anything. And she said, well, I knew you wouldn't. But what should I tell her? 
Well, I said, tow her to land her own fish. She said, okay. Well, we went back and she said to the lady, the pastor says, land your own fish. <laughs> <laughs> and the lady said, I don't, I don't know how. So my secretary just talked to her for a minute. And have you accepted Jesus? Well, yeah, I am. Well, were there any, was there a scripture used in that context? Well, yeah, I used John 3.16. Hey, that still works. <laughs> <laughs> did anybody pray? Well, you yeah. know, what did they say? Well, it, it was really, that'll, that'll come. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> and I'd forgotten all about it. It was midweek, and on Sunday after second service, this big guy coming right down the middle of the aisle, aiming right at me. And I thought, this is really going to be interesting, because I didn't know who it was. But he had me inside. And then I saw this lady behind me. I thought, he came up, stuck his hand out like that, and he said, I'm the fish. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I could have given an appointment, come in later to Jesus, but I didn't need to. Yes. Right. The worst thing you can do if you're fishing with somebody, if you want to lose your life real quick, when they get a fish on, grab the pole. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't grab the poles out of your people's hands. Put poles in their hands. See what I've been talking about all day. It's just so tremendously significant. Just, just the thought. You know, somebody said, oh, I only got 40 people in my church. 40 people? If you could get 40 people, if you could get 20 of those 40 people open for business three days a week, let's not even go full time here, <laughs> three days a week in their everyday life, can you imagine the impact you could have? It's just phenomenal. We underestimate the impact of one person. <clears throat> we just underestimate that. The ripple effect of one person in the community is absolutely profound. But don't, don't, don't complain because you don't have more people. I don't know how many it's supposed to be. How, 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 many, how big is the church supposed to be? Well, I have no idea. It has to do with what you've been called to do. Size only has significance in relationship to mission. That's why David had sinned when he what? When he numbered Israel. It seems to me that a commander in chief should know how many fighting men he's got, don't you? Schwarzkopf certainly knew how many he had. <clears throat> so when David said, I want to number the fighting men in Israel, it seems like an intelligent thing to do. If you're the general, go ahead and find out how many men you've got. God said, No, David, you're sinning. How come? Because in numbering Israel, he sent a message that was a wrong message. He was subscribing to a wrong idea. He was making the assumption, the wrong assumption, that the victory that Israel experienced in battle had something to do with the number of soldiers that went into that battle. And it never did. The only two things that Israel had to, had to find out when it went into battle, number one, is this battle a battle that the Lord is asking us to fight? And number two, is He going with us? That's, right. That's the only two things they had to know. Gideon, take 300, I'll be plenty. Jonathan, grab your armor, bury go up the cliff. That's all we need. We'll route the armor with two. Other times he said, get all the fighting men, hire all the mercenaries, and get anybody that'll go with you. See, numbers had to do with the nature of the battle. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, what have you been called to do? Any question of numbers has only to do with what you've been called to do. Well, I've been called to reach our community for Jesus. Okay, that's good. We know that. Okay, kid in sixth grade and understands that. What I'm asking you to say is, why are you in that community in terms of who you are and who you can be? Who have you been asked to touch there? You will touch people that I would not touch in this community. There are people that will listen to you that would never listen to me. Well, who are they? Well, I don't know. Well, what kind of impact am I supposed to have? See, those things have to do with memory. Success is not what we think it is. Success is not the numbers and the bylines. I, and I'm not against big numbers. The Bible's full of them. Boy, they knew how many people got saved on the day of Pentecost. It wasn't 3,000. That's not a bad, that's not a bad pioneer work. 3,000 people. Next time, 5,000. I mean, they, they kept track. They understood that. So I'm, I'm not against that. All I'm saying is don't attach your concept of success to the numerics of your ministry because they won't tell you what, what the truth is. You can have big numbers and not be doing what Christ wants you to do. 
And you can have small numbers and be right on target. That's right. Success has to do with what God has called you to do. What has he asked you to do? Now, the, the church that we're a part of in Seattle, the pastor there, I've known him for, for many years. In fact, he read the Love Acceptance book when he was just a young man over in Eastern Oregon, uh, Eastern Washington. He called me up. He said, could I come over and talk to you about that? And he came over and we struck up a friendship. And that was many years ago. We're still good friends. And, and, and uh, when we left East Hill, I'd, that was a conversation that, was, that, that we were supposed to have. So I went and worked with him for five years. Doing the pastoral care stuff would be really a phenomenal experience for me. And I've never been on church staff in my life. I went straight from seminary to Gresham and grew up with this thing. Had a, had a large staff for many years, but I'd never been on anybody's staff. And I told her, I said, man, I don't know what a good staff member is, and I don't know if I'm going to be a good one. I don't know if you're going to be a good boss. So let's do this one year at a time and see if we can survive each other. And we did, and uh, for five years. And then we made that change two years ago with, with their blessing to start traveling with that. He has a call that is very, very specific. <clears throat> He's called to reach the baby boomer generation in Seattle. Mm -hmm. That's his call. And that's who he targets. And that's who he's touching. That's who he's reaching. That's it. Now if you took what Doug is doing and moved it to another city and tried to do what he's doing in that city, I'm telling you, you'll do nothing but, but read confusion. I talked to a pastor, pastor in a city of, of 4,000 people, and he was trying to target baby boomers. I said, son, listen to me. You can pastor the entire community of 4,000 people. You'll not get them all in your church. You don't have to. But you can have pastoral influence in that entire community. Just, you know, just quit, quit trying to build Crystal Cathedral in a town of 4,000 people. This makes sense. <coughs> to target baby boomers. You know, just love anybody that needs love and go for it. Now, I have some problems with targeting. Doug and, I, Doug and I talk about it because the concept that I'm working with is self-targeting. The target is, who are you with? Mm -hmm. Where do you work? That's your target. Mm -hmm. See, the target becomes your associations. Amen. Don't, don't attach your success to how many, how much, or how big. Please don't do that. Simply sit down and sit in there doing what Jesus asked me to do. And if you are, go ahead, let yourself be a success. Go ahead. See, all, all we want is when it's over, he looks at us and says, you know, you did exactly what I had done. Mm -hmm. But Lord, I never had a day in church. See, from heaven's perspective, there aren't big churches or little churches. They're just the flock of God. Amen. With shepherds placed periodically through that flock to see what they're cared for. Mm -hmm. That's all. Don't fight about how many sheep happen to get put in your flock. If there are ten, give your life to them. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's fine. Don't play the numbers game personally. All it'll do is heap guilt on you. Mm -hmm. Just heap guilt on you. And, and, and you'll be angry with the people that are bigger. And you'll be proud that you're bigger than the people that are smaller. <laughs> and kill you. Just kill you. <coughs> the question is, shouldn't we have more people to touch? The question is, why has God allowed us to touch anybody? I mean, these are people that He died for. We're talking about people that God spilled His blood for. And we're griping because there aren't more of them that we can touch. Listen, we thank we gave you any assignment at all. Mm -hmm. Has he given you anything to do? Then do it with joy. Yeah, amen. There's a great statement. Don't bother doing well, which you shouldn't be doing at all. <laughs> What's God called you to do? Do it well. Don't bother doing what he hasn't asked you to do. Refine that. Be a focused person. What kind of people can you touch? Then touch it. What 
kind of sermons can you preach? Preach it. Well, I'm not a great communicator. Well, then be the greatest you can be. What, what can I say? Do work with the equipment God gave you and don't despise it. Amen. And don't give away your present or your plan for the future. Mm-hmm. You'll miss the uniqueness of who you are today. Amen. Well, we're only 50, but we're running like a church of 500. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Give your life for the 50 that are there. I believe in long-term planning. I also believe in, in, in handling today right. as though it's the most priceless, valuable possession of this world. Because I don't have tomorrow. And I can't give yesterday back, but I've got today. And I've got this time with you today. And this is the only thing I have to do today. Is be with you. It's not the only thing I could be doing. But it's the only thing I'm doing. There's nothing else going on on the planet for me today except to be here with you. I've got no other agenda. Of course I have a family. And sometimes people write notes to my wife and thank her for letting me go preach. But I, I understand that gesture, but you didn't do that. We all understand that this is where I'm supposed to be. Last weekend she was in Canada. That's where she was supposed to be. See, we can only do one day at a time. And if you really want to understand it, you only do one moment at a time. So you'll never again be who you are today. You'll never again hear these things the way you're hearing them today. And some of you have heard them before, but not the way you're hearing them today. That's right. Because you're a different person today. And if we'd have started tomorrow, you'd have been different because the day would have changed you. Do you follow? Mm-hmm. Don't, don't lose today. In the name of being successful, don't miss the people in your life right now. you got 75 people, maximize everything that you can do with 75 people. It's, it's incredible the kinds of things that can be done with a group of 75. You can do things with 75 people that you'll never be able to do with 150, or 200, 300, 500. Value the day. Value the people in your life today. Value being the pastor of the people that are in your life now. Don't trade away the people you have for the people you hope to get someday. I don't know how big you get, it doesn't matter. <coughs> do what Jesus asks you to do. And if he gives you a thousand, bless his name and do what he asks you to do with a thousand. If he gives you ten, great, bless his name and take the ten and do everything he asks you to do. That, that, that's, that's his business. So he, he handles that part. Okay? We just do what we're told. And he says, when you've done everything I told you, you're still in profitable service. So we're not in this thing to show a profit. <laughs> we're in this thing to do what he asks us to do. Amen. That's all I want to do today. I just want to do what he asks me to do. And if you were to walk in the door now, this was the end of the age, I so wanted to be able to say to me, and to you, and to each of us, you did what I asked you. You did what I asked you to do. In fact, you did more than I asked you. And I want to show you how. There was always more going on than you thought. We don't have any more. <laughs> Go ahead, let yourself be a success. <coughs> it's okay. <coughs> you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, you're really doing what Jesus is asking me. And the devil comes around and says, you know, you're a pitiful mess. Didn't God make a mistake when he called you? He could have got somebody in the whole town. <coughs> look at you. You get mad at your wife. Yell at the kids, you kick the dog. <laughs> you break the speed limit. What good are you? You just better hope you make it to heaven. <laughs> See, he comes along, kicks us, always kicks us like that. Always beats us up. Then you'll send Sister So and So that's never like any preacher in her whole life. That's right. And she'll say, You're just you're just not much of a pastor, my friend. <laughs> but hers isn't the book that counts. Amen. God's keeping a book. See? That, that's the point. Am I in his book? That's the book I want to be in. Amen. And after my name, I just wanted to put faithful service. That's all. That's all. Isn't that all you want? Mm-hmm. Right. We don't need any more than that. We're no big stuff. That, that just, that's just confusing. Well, that's all the overheads I've got, so I must be down with that group. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a minute, two minutes or five, whatever you want to do.
It's your money we're spending, so let's do it. <laughs> uh, let's, let's talk a little bit. We've covered a lot of stuff this morning. Let's interact just a little bit. We'll take a break and come back and I'll give you a make a list of 85 things and then we'll be gone. <laughs> <laughs> just a couple of things. But uh, what are you hearing? What are you thinking of? Just give me some playback here. And, uh, not, I don't want any huge long sermons, but just some statements. What you, I, I would just like to know what you're hearing right now, and then, then we're going to take some questions, whatever you'd like to say. I was struck with the similarity of a lot of what you're saying with the book by George Barna on the user-friendly church, where he says that leadership is, is recognizing people who are already ministering and then adding support and structure to that, uh -huh. as opposed to having a program and then trying to recruit people into uh -huh. it. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's true. I've talked with George about some of those concepts. It's very, it's very interesting. It's a very helpful thing to that book. I tend to think of user-friendly people rather than user-friendly churches. I want to be a user-friendly person in my world. And, uh, but but yeah, you're right. And the ability to see ministering people and support them. Again, we're going back to seeing the church in the world and giving support to that, rather than calling it out of the world, good instruction, and trying to find it, just chuck it back in where it's been all the time. So, well, I had I had two observations, and they're really quite simple. First, the field and the force. And I was listening to you as you went uh, out riding one Sunday morning with your wife, and you found some motorcycle people. And where were you going? You were going to church. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. And so. There's a semantics thing mm -hmm. relative to, you know, do we throw the whole uh, baby out of the bathwater here? I mean, can we still go to church on Sunday? Or do we have to go to a meeting place? Do we have to go to a worship center? Can we still go to church, like you had just indicated? Or do we have to be so careful with what we're doing that we, we if we, we slip on a banana peel and we're, we're back into the field, of the church of the field? Oh, yeah. See, man, I'm not talking straight jackets here, obviously. What I meant by church was the gathering of the believers. I understand that. And, and that's where we gather. We have a location, we have an address, and if you want to get there, you can get there. And, and so, so what I'm, I, yeah, it's a valid, it's a valid point. And, and I don't think that we just have to change semantics. I do think, however, that uh, I do, I do believe that offhand remarks are valuable trainers. And one of the things that we did a lot with our staff was to talk about our offhand remarks, our off-the-cuff remarks. Are they consistent with our beliefs? It was difficult to do that in a way that still allowed them to be spontaneous. Sometimes we succeeded, sometimes we didn't. But uh, I, I know radio, broad, radio uh, stations, when they come into an area, they'll target a certain segment of that area, and then they will design offhand remarks, have a list of them, this is what this person said. It sounded like he just popped off his head, and he's reading off this list of offhand remarks. So we do communicate a lot with our sides and our offense. But we mustn't, we mustn't take that into bondage at all. The, the concept of the church that I'm, that I'm suggesting here is a way of seeing. It's a way of understanding. So did you begin it's to be change, your, it's change your terminology? terminology? I mean, yeah. did you consciously begin to change your terminology relative to these things? And now, the, I, think, the staff, I, I, think, I think in our staff we would discuss what are we communicating with our, with our vocabulary. With our, and and it, it, as I say, it's very difficult to do that without being legalistic and, and all, but we, we miss the power <coughs> of one of and of us. And uh, so I would try to probably correct myself. I missed that one. But it, it's, we can't use that as bondage, Bill. It cannot be, you know, and we're back. It's not that, because no matter what my semantics are, I'm deeply committed to the church of force, and I do know the difference. You know, and, and yeah. living into that concept, I think. Well, I was just, uh, it was kind of refreshing to me to see you yeah. made that boo-boo, so. Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, yeah I, I, I don't know that it was even a boo-boo. I've probably have done it a lot. Sure. Because there is a place where the church meets. Yeah. And, uh, but over time, within the context of a congregation, we try to have our semantics align with the concepts that we're doing. We, we even did that with our songs. You know, sing songs that make theological sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, the song to locate God out there and try to get him to come here and get me over there. That, that, that does damage to the idea that God really dwells within me and, and, and I, he'll never be closer to me than he is right now. So we... There, there does need to be consistency. But, but it can't be a legalistic kind of thing. 
put people in a different straight jacket then. What we're trying to do is get them free. Once you be free enough to go ahead and minister to Jesus. Someone else? Yeah, I just had a, a comment, a thought that was uh, so, so often our, uh, our language or terminology will uh, be affected by our thinking. So what we need is, it always is affected by our thinking. We need a paradigm shift in our thinking. The example is when I stop thinking of the Holy Spirit as an it and a person, I no longer will say, refer to it, the Holy Spirit as it, mm -hmm. as a thing. I'm, I'm very much in touch and in tune with the fact the Holy Spirit is a person. Yeah. And I think the same thing is, uh, for what you're saying as a church, is of course, when we have a revelation of that, it'll really grab hold in our minds, our hearts, it'll start to come forth in our speech. Yeah, I, I think too, you know, as, uh, as you're talking, I'm just, I'm just thinking that one of the things, this kind of goes back to what you were saying, but one of the things that, that we were constantly endeavoring to do was use good illustrations of what we meant by the term church. The story that I told this morning about the lady. Well, was I wanted her to tell that story, but she, she just couldn't bring herself to do that. And I said, "Well, can I tell it for you?" And she said, "Sure, be glad." But but the reason I wanted to tell that story because it's such a great illustration of what we mean by church. And I was always looking for stories. Now that's that's church. That that's church. This is the church gathering. That's extremely important. And if we had time in another day, we would need to go through the reasons that the church gathers now. Because once we conceive of the church ministry in the world, it does change the dynamics of why we get together at all and what we do when we do come together. You have to have both an inhale and an exhale in a healthy body. What we've been talking about today is the exhale. There has to be this in, this intaking of life and the exhaling of the world. And, and so that's why the part of it, I'm just, I'm just only doing one side of the coin today. I, I hope it doesn't feel imbalanced to you because I'm deeply committed to gathering in the church. But I want when the church gathers to be able to say, that's, that's church. That's what church is. Uh, it's, it's such a... People remember stories. And, and I'm looking for stories. And so that affects semantics as well. But I, I'm, more than words, I'm looking for pictures. People tend to think in stories and in pictures. And we communicate stories and pictures, we're going to communicate rather well mm -hmm. over time and then we communicate to memory. Because you remember stories. Somebody paints a picture, tell you about it, you remember that. Mm -hmm. and so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying today to, to, to tell you some stories, but what we're going to do is paint a picture in your mind. So when you hear the word church, certain things will come off the canvas and Sure, there's one more thing I just like to, I don't want to capture at this time, but one area that I'm having a difficult time with, and we might as well speak about these difficult things because otherwise we'll never be able to resolve them, but the, the, the attitude of the minister lady, um, dichotomy, and um, there, has to, there has to be, and I, and I would like to know where you draw that line. I mean, you are the pastor of your church. Did everybody have the freedom to do whatever they wanted to do? They want, if they wanted to preach, they would preach. They say, say the word, they would say the word. Was there any control? You know, I've, I've tried this, uh, let people be free to express themselves. And you know what it does oftentimes? It, it can just rip your heart out because it can divide a church. I mean, it, it, I mean it just stirs, I mean, because you've got generally people who are taking the advantage of doing that are the ones who are not stable let's be honest with you and and so where do you, where do you draw this line what where, where do you well we okay. draw the line in terms of function we don't draw the line in terms of ladder i'm not higher up the ladder i do have the function of pastor and nobody else has that here i'm the pastor that's not a multiple giftedness to this church i'm the pastor and nobody else has that function that doesn't mean put, put me over you or under you it means that i have certain functions as a pastor and biblically this is what those functions are and this is how they're going to work out See, we're, we're, we're equal in terms of fellowship, in terms of the enjoyment of the Holy Spirit, but everybody does not have the same function. Everybody does not have the same office. And we have to acknowledge that and recognize that. But what I can't do is wear that office as a separatist, elitist, holier-than-you-are, spiritual giant kind of thing. I can't do that. That, because of my comfortableness with that office and with... My, my response to present, I'm free then to be myself because we're not going to, I, it's not a role I have to play, it's an identity that Christ has given me. 
and who, whoever I'm with and whatever I'm doing, I'm going to have pastoral in, in, in fact, impact into that person's life. In a local church, I was I was the gift that the Lord did in that local church. And we, we would teach on that very, very specifically. This was, but we would not do it in a hierarchical thing. I'm not more spiritual than you. I don't sin less than you. But I've been asked by Christ to have this relationship within the context of the church, and that's where we are. But there had to be a certain amount of authority based on your position relative to dumb dumb stuff going on. Somebody had to check it, right? Or not. Well, I was doing that. You were it, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. We're not questioning that at all. But, okay, well see that that tends to be a thought out there. You, yeah. you understand? I understand that. that. Yeah, I understand that. And, so, and I'm glad to answer. Yeah. You know, I'm glad to answer to that. No, we're not talking about that at all. We we are talking here. See, pastor is a very specific function within the body of Christ. And his purpose is to perfect saints for the work of the ministry. The word perfect means to align correctly, mm -hmm. to put in healing postures. Uh, and also, it means it's, it's a, a medical term. It's also a fishing term. It means to mend nets, uh, heal up wounds. But mending nets also include not just fixing them, but it meant laying them, folding them in a way on the back of the boat because of the way they fit. So they could take that thing and throw it out, and it would go up and get all tangled up before. But they throw it out and had weights around the edge, and it would go down and capture the fish. They pull it in like a, like a reverse sink. And, and uh, mending nets had to do with repairing and folding them correctly so that when they're thrown out, they would in fact build. Well, that's a very beautiful picture of what the pastor is supposed to do. Uh, I am a person who, the medical term is, sets a joint, puts something back in place. And people get out of joint with each other. I'm the one that puts them back into a healing relationship. I'm also the one that relates them in a way so that when they're, when they're placed out into the world, they will in fact do what, what that is. And so we, we have some. Per I never, you know, I never really have a problem with authority. Mm -hmm. um, and you only have the authority that people give you. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. You can yell and scream, "My pastor!" all day long, and all I have to do is walk out. Mm -hmm. You can be pastor, but I don't have to let you be mine. So authority is something is a gift that people give. Yes. And, but we can yeah. define what those kinds of things are and be responsible within the context mm -hmm. of those definitions. Yeah. So don't hear me. I'm not saying everybody does their own thing. So our whole purpose, the reason we are here is to effectively release you in ministry into the world. Everything we do will be pressing towards that purpose. Everything. So that means I will guard who comes in and talks to you. And it's going to in your butt every week. You get them? Every week. Somebody's called to come and preach in the church. Not my church. I don't know who called them. Mm -hmm. Gave them the wrong address. Did something. <laughs> you know, I, I, because I'm, I, I, there's a specific thing going on here, and everything we do will serve that purpose, and we won't bring cross currents into that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Anything else? Back when you were talking about everyone should do what it is that God's called them to do, and nothing else, remind me of a comment I heard last week. A speaker said that God is not required to pay for anything he doesn't order. Yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you all hear that? <laughs> God's not required to pay for anything he doesn't order. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's it. It's one of the statements you wish you made yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's grab a cup of coffee. There's some food back there. Let's come back in about 10 minutes. We'll wrap this thing up. <laughs>